כן, אוקיי, okay, אז בואו נתחיל. Right, I think we'll switch to English, if that's okay. Um, we are uh, looking today at the parish of Miketz. Last week, for those who were here last week or those who were not here last week, we did something special on Hanukkah, although it's still Hanukkah tonight. Um, however, uh, we are returning to our uh, studies of the parsha. The weekly parsha Miketz is a blockbuster. We read about the rise of Yosef literally from the dungeon to the palace. That's my going to show And um, I'd like to begin at the beginning. So if you've got a Chumash, then that is wonderful. Um, you will uh, find it at the beginning of chapter 41. Uh, and it says, mm -hmm. That gives the name to the parish, of course. Miketz. Miketz means at the end of. Kates means the, the end or the like... Uh, a threshold, a person who is progressing and he reaches the end, he reaches his destination, that's called Kates. We have Kates called Basar Balafanai and that sort of thing. Miketz Shnasayim Yamim implies that the time elapsing was waiting for something to happen. It's almost as if uh, an event was not quite ready to unfold until the threshold of two years was reached. And this gives rise to the rabbinic tradition that Yosef was forced to languish in prison for another two years, as if to say that uh, he didn't need to be in prison any longer in terms of maybe his own fate, but for some particular reason, it was only in two further years that Pharaoh had, his, Pharaoh had the dream, and Yosef was then summoned from the dungeon to interpret the dreams, as is very well known. So that's hinted to in the words, if we turn back to the uh, end of Parshas Vayeshev, we have Yosef who interprets the dreams, of course, of the butler and the baker. And they each had a dream the same night, troubling dream. Yosef saw that they were distressed and he said, you know, maybe I can help. Uh, God is the one to interpret the dreams, but maybe Hashem will uh, provide me with some insight, which I, which I can share with you. Of course, all of this is very well known. He interprets the dream of the butler in a favorable way. And he says, in three more days, uh, Pharaoh will uh, lift up your head. That is to say, he will elevate you and restore you to your position. And then he adds the fateful words. Take a look in chapter 40, verse 14. Uh, Yudalad. It's just at the end of last week's parsha. Ki im zechar tani idcha kasher yitav lach vasisa na imadi chesed vihis kartani el paro vote se sanam in habayis hazeh. He says, please, will you um, when you are re restored to your position, remember me. And remember the fact that I have bestowed a benefit upon you and perform for me a chesed, a kindness. V'hiz kartani, mention me to Pharaoh. V'hod seisan, I mean, Abayi says that he will bring me out of this prison. So Yosef said, zachartani v'hiz kartani, remember me and mention my name to Pharaoh. Remember me, remember me to Pharaoh. The parsha ends, last week's parsha ends with the words that the butler did not remember him. Forgot all about him. And then, as if to say, for that reason, Yosef was uh, destined to languish for two more years in prison. Say the sages, and this is what Rashi mentions, you'll find it already in that Pasuk Yudalid. He says, remember me, says Rashi, Actually, Yosef should not have relied upon the butler. He was wrong to have placed his trust in the butler. He should have put his trust only in Hashem. And for that reason, because of the two words, Zachartani, his Kartani, he was condemned to remain for two year, two more years in prison. Of course, the question that all the Mafarshim ask, and I'm sure it's on our minds as well, I hope it is, if you've been listening up till now, is that fair? Is it really fair to criticize Yosef for uh, exercising exerting some natural, um, like almost uh, intuitively obvious uh, effort to 
encouraged or asked the butler to help him get out of this pit. In other words, Yosef has um, been uh, thrown into the, the, the prison also for no fault of his own, as we remember from last week's Barsha. So if he wants to escape, if he wants to somehow uh, get an, an advocate, to win an advocate, this is a natural way to do it. Is it really fair to fault him for this? So Rav Yunus and Aibshitz, as I said, asks this question, B'Shem, I'm a forshim, all I'm a forshim asked. And he says the answer is that, yes, a certain measure of his shtadlus, of, um, of uh, industry, is appropriate. But you, I, I mean, he asked the question this way, what method would Yosef or could Yosef have hoped for with regard to his redemption from prison through the agency of divine favor other than with the help of another person? I mean, would he have to rely on Hashem supernaturally elevating him from the dungeon? Of course, the way that it is reasonable for Yosef to hope for Hashem to redeem him from prison is through the agency of influence or someone who has uh, the ear of Pharaoh, etc. What has he done wrong? Says the Rabbi Yonas and Ibshitz, he was wrong to put his trust in such a wicked person. Yosef it would have been reasonable for him to have, uh, you know, trust, or at least to, for him to to rely upon the good offices of someone who is decent, someone who is who is a person of integrity. But this scoundrel, this wicked uh, Egyptian courtier, he should not have relied upon him. Uh, I uh, remember many years ago, my Rosh Hashiva Zechorin Racha. Uh, had uh, a need to go to a doctor, a certain specialist. And I don't remember, it's not important exactly what the medical necessity was, but it was a serious matter. And he made some inquiries and he was recommended to uh, go to a certain specialist. The specialist was a Jewish man, but he was a uh, um, completely secular and he was hostile to rabbis, to those who keep the Torah. He was a nasty piece of work. The Rosh Hashiva met with him once and he declined to go back to him. And he said at the time, according to what I recall, that he said, I can't believe that my obligation for Hishtadlus, for um, uh, you know, industry to look after my health, will require me to rely upon such a wicked person. Surely Hashem will enable me to get the, the cure that I need through the uh, medical intervention of a different specialist, a different expert, a different doctor, rather than through the agency of such a person. And essentially, this is what Rionos and Abshit suggests here as well. And he says, and if you ask, how does Yosef know the inner life of these uh, people who are with him in prison? It's like you say, you know, I've got a gardener. Do I know what kind of a person he is in his private life? Or I have a car mechanic or uh, I have an accountant or I have a, a structural engineer that I engage to do some work for me. Do I know about his personal life? Says Rav Yonas and Ibshitz, yes, Yosef does know because he interpreted his dream. And I like this uh, psychological insight because it's like you say, Yosef is his therapist. So since the butler and the baker, they told Yosef their dreams. So the nature of such an interaction is there is a disclosure. There is an insight into the inner life of that person. So Hashem enabled Yosef to have a window into the life, into the mind, into the thinking, maybe even into the soul of these people. And Yosef should have realized that this person is a scoundrel and it was wrong, therefore, for Yosef to expect or to imagine or to put his trust in his uh, like uh, uh, connection that he was able to cultivate with such a person as the one who's going to redeem him from, from the prison. So I think that's interesting. Like I said, you know, someone who is a therapist or has that kind of relationship with another person, um, of course, he's not allowed to exploit it, but it does enable him to know what kind of person that really is at Yosef's level of um, uh, spiritual perfection. He should have been above relying on such a person and therefore he was condemned to languish for those extra two years in prison. Uh, if we go a bit further, Yosef is... Uh, 
elevated not only from the prison, but as we said, to the palace, and he becomes the viceroy. And not only that, but of course, his position is one of extreme importance for Egypt. He has interpreted the dreams of Pharaoh, and sure enough, the seven, day, the seven years of plenty have arrived, the seven years of famine begin, and we're looking now at chapter 41, Perak Mem Aleph Pasuk Nun, Dalit. So the Torah says, the seven years of plenty ended and uh, it was um, bountiful. Uh, and then in verse 54, the seven years of famine began. As Joseph had foreseen. There was famine in all of the lands. That is to say, the whole region was suffering in the grip of a famine. But in the land of Egypt, there was bread. Great. And this was the plan. And this was uh, Yosef now has his hour of glory, not just an hour, but uh, many months, maybe years, because he's now in a position to save Egypt from the famine. The whole of the land of Egypt was hungry. And they called out, they cried out to Pharaoh for bread. Go to Joseph. I show you whatever he says to you, that's what you've got to do. He's my viceroy. He's the uh, the um, uh, you know the ministry of uh, economics and uh, finance and all of that. Okay, so they go to Yosef. Rashi says, Yosef, go to Yosef. Whatever he says to you, you should do. So take a look. At Rashi, for those who have the comments of Rashi there, I show you Malachem Tasu, because Yosef told them that they should circumcise themselves, Shiamulu. And when they came to Pharaoh and they said, uh, look what he's telling us to do, circumcise ourselves. We're not interested in that. So So Pharaoh said to the people, well, why didn't you stockpile your own grain in that case? So they said, we did, but it all spoiled. So then Pharaoh said, if that's, if that's the case, if Yosef was able to, through his uh, spiritual or magical powers in the imagination of Paro, was able to bring about such a, a consequence that everyone's stockpiled grain uh, spoiled and, and decomposed, but only the official uh, stockpiling for the country has been preserved, then uh, we better comply because otherwise, you know, he might uh, instruct the heavenly forces that we should die and, you know, Therefore, we're completely dependent upon him. This is the Medrash that Rashi quotes. Rav Yonasan Aibshitz takes up the question as to why. What, what was Yosef's motivation? Why did he insist that they should be circumcised? Or if you'd like to put it differently, uh, what prompted the sages to uh, advance this Medrashic interpretation that this was Yosef's intention, this was his requirement, they should be circumcised. So probably the simple answer is that when his brethren would come down to Egypt some years later, they would all be circumcised, of course, but in order for them not to be a pariah, not to be anathematized because of it, um, he brought about that they should all be circumcised so that his family would not suffer any sort of um, uh, discrimination as a result. Okay, that, that could be. But that's Alder Hapshat. Rabbi Yosan Abshitz has a few suggestions and I want to share with you two of them. He says that the fate of Egypt in terms of the mazal, mazal meaning the constellations, the, the destiny for Egypt was that they should suffer an intense famine for seven years and it would bring about devastation, widespread uh, illness and disease and death from famine, a terrible fate. How could Yosef redeem them from such a fate? So he says the key here is the number seven. Seven years he saw in his, Pharaoh saw in the dream seven uh, cows and then seven years of grain. The seven symbolizes the natural order of things. And although we are very much familiar with that in our tradition, that there's seven days in the week and Hashem created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, which brought the natural order to its completion. And therefore the world unfolds in cycles of seven. But he adds another point, which I'm sure I've seen in else, elsewhere, but uh, he reminded me of it, that in the ancient world, they 
recognize Sheva Kochve Lechet, seven moving stars. That is to say, um, I'm no astronomer, but the ancients were often uh, quite knowledgeable about astronomy, albeit their grasp of the subject was very primitive in our terms, but in some ways it was at the same time quite advanced. They recognized that some stars seem to move. And those are the moving stars, which are in fact planets. And they recognized that they had a completely different role than the, the other stars that we can perceive. And they said there are seven planets. Of course, they didn't realize that Earth is also one of those planets. And then uh, Neptune, uh, uh, Uranus, Pluto, you know, the further out planets they were not aware of. But they were um, able to count seven stars, seven moving stars. And in the view of the ancients, that suggests, and that's why the number seven suggests that which is subordinate to natural forces, to the heavenly forces, but not heavenly in the sense of, uh, you know, from Hashem, but heavenly in the sense of the forces of nature that dictate and determine human affairs. This is the idea of the, the zodiac or the horoscope, which probably in Jewish terms, we don't buy into that much. But nevertheless, we do find references to it in our tradition. I'll call upon him, the Egyptians, the seven years of famine and the seven that appeared in the dreams is associated with the seven moving planets, which suggests that the mazal, the destiny of Egypt was that they should succumb to devastation in these seven years. How will they go beyond it? How will they transcend the destiny, the fate which is written in the stars? The answer is through Mila, because circumcision is that which symbolizes the supernatural, the ability to uh, like control nature. And this is part of the symbolism of the circumcision that symbolizes the ability of a person, I mean a man, to control his nature. It doesn't uh, happen automatically, but that's what it symbolizes. Also, of course, although he doesn't say this, but I'm sure he's alluding to the fact that Mila, Brit Mila is on the eighth day. Now, it wasn't on the eighth day for the Egyptians, but the idea of Mila is it is on the eighth day. And the eighth day, of course, symbolizes that which transcends the natural order. And because it is the eighth night of, eighth night of Hanukkah, we can make reference to the Hanukkah connection with that as well. So he says, this is why Yosef told them Lamul, because they needed the merit of Mila or needed the symbolism of Mila in order to be able to survive beyond the seven years of famine, in order to take them forward beyond the seven years of famine into the, the I'm sorry, no, no. after the seven years of plenty in order to survive the seven years of famine, I need to get the sequence right, uh, he, he insisted they should have, they should circumcise themselves. Then he says something else completely different, which I think is very clever. Not that Rabbi Yonas Amshis needs my endorsement, but that's why I've chosen this thought among my other ideas to share with you tonight. He says that, you know, the Egyptians were very prosperous. Egypt at that time was the major superpower, economic power in the entire region, maybe in all of antiquity uh, during that era. And it was a, a time and a place of great prosperity. And that doesn't mean every Egyptian was wealthy, but surely there were many who were prosperous. And once Yosef predicted this famine, so surely there were people who in the seven years of plenty, either stockpiled grain, which we said that maybe didn't work, but probably some would have sold the grain, whether exported it, whatever it might be, and would have amassed some resources. So they are the ones who were able to go to Yosef and pay to buy the grain. That was the whole idea. Yosef stockpiled it and he was able to sell it. That's how the uh, Royal coffers were greatly uh, enriched through the, the um, involvement of Yosef. What about the poor? And here we go back to the Pasuk in, in Pasuk uh, Nun He. It says, uh, uh, verse 55, They were all hungry. They said to Pharaoh, give us bread. So Romans Haipshit says the rich were able to buy. They were able to buy from Yosef. What about the poor? They had no money to buy. And they're own fields that were normally producing uh, barley or wheat, whatever it may be, were producing nothing because of this famine. So they said to Paro, you've got to provide for us. You know, we're looking to you. Kiyad HaMelech. So Yosef said the following to Pharaoh. He said, look, if I sell to the rich and I give to the poor, you know, for, for free, uh, 
what will happen is it's like a bit like in New York when I was in Yeshiva in New York. So some of the younger light, probably still true, got by on food stamps. Food stamps are the uh, federal program in the United States or maybe state program in New York. I'm not quite sure. Uh, probably federal program that those who are below, below a certain income per capita, whatever the size of the family, they're eligible for food stamps and they can use those uh, like... Um, coupons to buy uh, food, I don't know, for any type of food or staples in the local uh, grocery store. Um, those are food stamps. So those are eligible for the food stamps. So they go to Yosef and they get for free. Says Yosef to Pari, you know what's going to happen? The rich are going to say, yeah, we're also poor. It's going to be benefits fraud. They're going to buy at, at market prices. Then they're going to go and they're also going to claim that they want the uh, freebie handout. They're going to have double portion. They're going to sell the portion they got for free. They're going to sell it either in Egypt or they're going to export it for a, a, a profit. They'll make a killing. So they'll work the system. They'll exploit the system. So says Yosef to Paro, I've got an idea. I'm going to require whoever wants, for, whoever wants to buy, Vakasha, you can buy. Whoever doesn't want to buy, whoever can't buy, whoever wants for free, so then you've got to be circumcised. In this way, says Yosef, Yosef said to Paro, no one is going to submit to circumcision if he doesn't need it. Only those who can't afford to buy, who need the, the, the provision for free as a handout, they're the ones who are going to be willing to submit to circumcision. And that's in that way, of course, many people were in that position and therefore many people were subjected to, super, to, to circumcision la, la mul, in that way. What was his intent? He says, says we understand, I'm it's, a, it's a parallelism which I had not considered and I don't know why, but uh, that's why I'm uh, just a uh, Pasha Yid and I'm not a great uh, scholar like, like the Mepharshim. I don't know, I never thought of it. There's a parallelism here. It wasn't that long before when the brothers of Yosef, the sons of Yaakov, I should say really the brothers of Dina, cooked up a plan to insist that the people of Shechem should be circumcised. And because they were circumcised, a terrible massacre was carried out against them. Yosef wanted to rectify their transgression. The people of Shechem, through the circumcision, they met their death through this terrible massacre. The people of Mitzrayim, Yosef wanted them to get life through circumcision. Al Yedei Mila, he says, you'll have life. Those who, who submit to, to Bris Mila will be the ones who will live, the ones who are given the, the, uh, the provision in order to live. So he says, this is the tikkun. This is the, the idea of why the uh, uh, Yosef had that uh, requirement of uh, Bris Mila. Uh, let's go on now to um, the following perek, the beginning of chapter 42, Membeis, and here, we have an interesting uh, turn of phrase. Yaakov says to his family, Yaakov was aware that in uh, um, Egypt, there's provision. Vayomer hine shamati, I'm reading uh, chapter 42, verse two. Vayomer hine shamati ki yesheva b'mitzrayim. There is provision in Egypt. Rudu shama, go down there. V'shivru lana ma'a, I'm sorry, v'shivru lana misham, and uh, 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 get, uh, acquire provisions from for us from there. Then we then we will live and not die. You know what? I'm sorry. I need to tell you the pasuk before as well. That's the important one. Uh, so it's just the edition that I'm using has so many perushim that I had to turn back a couple of pages to find it. So just look at the previous pasuk. Mem base pasuk Aleph. Vayar Yaakov ki yesheva b'mitzrayim. Yaakov saw that there was provision in Egypt. Vayomer Yaakov levanav. Lama tisra'u. Why do you make yourselves conspicuous? The word titra is an interesting word. It doesn't mean lama tir'u. It doesn't say why do, why do you see. Yaakov saw that there is provision in Egypt. And he says, why make yourselves visible? Why make yourselves conspicuous? Why flaunt your wealth? Says the uh, Rashi, don't appear. Take a look at Rashi. Lama tira lama, tira, lama tar'u atzmechem. Why do you... Um, um, project yourselves in the sight of the sons of Yishmael and the sons of Esav 
as if you have ample food. Don't be conspicuous. B'nai Esav, B'nai Yishmael, these are our cousins. But if they see that we are well fed, then uh, they'll be jealous of us possibly. I have to say that please, those who are able to join us on Shabbos at Kesher for the Dvar Torah after davening, we have a beautiful, brilliant insight, Al Pi Musar, into this comment of Rashi. Lama Tisrao, why are you displaying yourself? Why be conspicuous before the uh, B'nai Yishmael and B'nai Esav? But for tonight, I'd like to tell you what Rabbi Yonsen Eibschitz has to say about this, which is also, I think, fascinating. Uh, how is it? So Rashi says that they had enough uh, provision. Yaakov and his family, they were not um, uh, smitten with hunger because they were also aware, they heard, they had no idea it was Yosef, of course, but they were aware that Pharaoh, the Egyptian king, had these dreams and they were interpreted in a particular way. Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. So naturally, uh, other people would also want to stockpile during the, during the seven years of plenty. Actually, the Mepharshim say, Rashi says, that the seven years of famine was in the entire region that we saw explicitly. The seven years of plenty was in Egypt. But in any case, Yaakov was a prudent. He had maybe a good investment advisor, maybe Schmidt uh, partners or something like that. And he got good advice and he was prudent. And therefore he had a, a prosperous portfolio. He had enough grain. Yaakov stockpiled grain and his grain did not spoil because of the blessing this is what Rav Yosef Aibshe says, because of the blessing that he received from Yitzchak. Yitzchak gave him a blessing, Mishmane Haaretz, Mital HaShamayim, U Mishmane Haaretz. Mital HaShamayim, U Mishmane Haaretz, from the dew of heaven and from the, the bounty, from the fat of the land. In other words, you, Yaakov, will be very prosperous. That was the blessing that Yitzchak gave to Yaakov. Now remember, when Yaakov approached Esav, at the beginning of uh, the previous parasha, the beginning of um, Vayishlach, the week before last, beginning of Vayishlach, Yaakov was anticipating meeting Esav. And he uh, said, um, and he says, Yishli shor v'chamor, Vahidi shor v'chamor, an ox and a donkey. Says Rashi there, Yaakov was saying to Esav, you know, our father gave me the blessing that we all thought was intended for you, or you certainly thought it was intended for you, about Talashamayim, Shmane Haaretz. Well, a, 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 an ox and a donkey are not from the heavens, and they're not from the, from the earth. They don't grow from the ground. They don't come down from heaven. So therefore, what I have acquired is not the fulfillment of our father's blessing. That's how he was sort of apologizing or saying to Esav, don't hate me because the blessing has not been fulfilled. That's also in Lavan. Garti, right? She says, I did not become an eminent, prominent, renowned personality. I was just there as a sojourner. That's Yaakov's obsequious approach to Esav. The problem is that Tal HaShamayim, says Rav Yonasen Eibshitz, has the segula of preventing the grain from spoiling. Because Shmane Haaretz, if the, if the produce of the land is very rich, it means it spoils more quickly. It's like a, a fruit which is ripe or overripe, so it gets very sweet when it's ripe. But you know, if you leave it for another couple of days outside the refrigerator, it spoils. So he says, Shmane Haaretz, if the fruit, if the produce is wonderful, then that's great and it's valuable and it's tasty and it's nourishing, but it can spoil readily as well. So Tal HaShamayim, the dew from heaven has the quality, and I'm not certain if this is true scientifically, but at least metaphorically has the quality of preserving the Shmane Haaretz. Says, Rav Yonasen Eibshitz, that if we allow the sons of Esav to see that we've got uh, 
grain that our provisions have not spoiled, then they will realize that the blessings of Shmane Haaretz and Tal HaShemayim have come to us. If that's the case, they're going to hate us. And if the hatred comes back, then Esav's old intention to kill me is going to be rekindled. So therefore he says, that, that's why it says in Pasuk Beis, Vayamina Shamati, that, we sh- that there's Shever B'Mitzrayim, go there, V'nichyev Alonamus, we live and we won't die, we won't die at the hands of Esav, because his jealousy will be kindled when he realizes that the blessings of Shmane Haaretz and Tal HaShemayim have been fulfilled. So therefore, don't let him realize that. Don't let him see that we're sitting pretty. We've got plenty of provisions, but rather we must go down to Egypt with all the other people of Canaan in order to acquire uh, uh, provisions and grain uh, in, at that, uh, in, in that way. Um, I had a third, uh, rather a fourth thought, but I see our time has already uh, finished up. So let's let's leave it at that. So we've seen, I I hope, three interesting insights. I'll just review them very briefly. Mikesh uh, Saim Yamim, two years. Yosef languished in prison for two more years because he put his faith in the butler. And if you say, well, what's wrong with putting his faith in the butler? So according to the approach that we have suggested, the butler was a scoundrel, such a villain. Yosef should not have expected that his redemption will come through the agency of such a, a, uh, a wicked, villainous personality. And Yosef will have known what kind of person he is because he was his therapist. He told, uh, the butler told Yosef his dreams. Yosef had an insight into his character and therefore on that kind of person, Yosef should not have relied. That's the first thing we said. The second thing is that he instructed them to be circumcised. One reason was that the Mila symbolizes that which transcends the natural order. It represents eight, which is beyond the seven, the influence of the seven planets symbolizing the destiny of Egypt. So if their destiny was to actually, uh, uh, you know, suffer tremendous devastation because of the, of the um, uh, famine. So this enabled them to, to, to transcend that. Just want to say, um, someone has asked me, Nancy has asked me a good question that ultimately the redemption did come through the, through the butler. Uh, it's true, but the point is that it came when Hashem decided that, um, that he needs the two more years. I'm just thinking I saw in the Meshach Chachma. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose the difference is uh, that if the butler had told Paro right away, you know, I am here, I've been restored because there's a lovely, very clever guy, you know, young uh, Hebrew in, in the prison and he helped, he helped me out. So that would have been Yosef kind of uh, enjoying the benefits of this, of this butler. In the end, the butler became just like a... Um, uh, j- just like a, a medium, because he began, he approached Paro and said, es hayom. I'm going to have to admit my transgression and I'm going to recall. So ultimately, the butler didn't sort of um, like use his own initiative, but he was only a, a, a pawn in the hands of, of higher forces. So it's true, your, your point is valid that it, ultimately the butler was the conduit uh, for his delivery, but he kind of, you could say, Yosef had a rap on the knuckles. He was uh, rebuked by having to remain in prison for those two more years. Okay, it's, it's a good question though, a valid point. But it's not a question, I don't remember, it's an Aymshid, it's a really yes. question on, on Rashi, because Rashi himself says that. And then just to finishing our summary, the other interpretation we said is that about the, the circumcision that Yosef said, the rich can pay. But the poor who want to get for free, for if you want a freebie, then you've got to submit to circumcision. That way, those who can afford it will rather pay cash than submit to the, the surgery. And as a result of circumcising all those Egyptians, Yosef was able to rectify in a certain sense the hate uh, vis-a-vis the people of Shechem, where the Brit Milah was the the um, the means by which the the... 
a conduit for their, de their death. And here it was the means of life. And then lastly, we said about Lama Tisra'u, why be conspicuous before B'nai Yishmael, B'nai Esav in particular, because Yosef, uh, Yaakov realized that the fact that their provisions did not spoil showed that they did receive the blessing of Yitzchak, it was fulfilled, Tala Shemaim, Shmanei Haaretz, and then the anger and the jealousy, the resentment that Esav had spoken about so long before and his intention to kill Yaakov could indeed come to fruition. So we leave it at that. Thank you for everyone for listening and especially for those who have asked me some stimulating yes. questions along the way. If there are any other questions or comments, then I'm happy to um, I have take a them. question. First, I agree with the objection of Mrs. Ziskind, because Miketz and the end of the previous parasha are a poignant a text whose leading theme is the atrociousness of need, of being needy. Because when you are in need, well, it is you are in need, the others, it may not matter to them. The butler, why it is written there? So that we would ask ourselves, aren't we like the butler? I think that the behavior of the butler, which in the end was good, even though it is extremely lamentable that he forgot. Belated by two years, two years belated. Yeah, and he says yes, that yes, he forgot. Yes, I told you about 25 years before the <laughs> lesson. Yes, but it is very important because if we start to say he was weak, he was Egyptian and that, HaKadosh Baruch Hu also participates in this lesson on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, but look, we the, the... damn the butler, perhaps he would damn us, because in my experience, the behavior of the butler is very widespread, it's very ordinary. The extraordinary thing is when one moves one finger and may change the life on another one for the better in a life changing way. Yeah, that look, I, 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 think, I think it's true that uh, we cannot deny that the butler became the medium through which Yosef was redeemed from prison. That is true. Yes, but Rabin remember, he only, but, yeah, but he only did it in a self-serving way when Pharaoh was desperate for someone to interpret his dreams. So then the butler realized he could earn some kudos with Pharaoh. So whereas his gratitude to Yosef was completely cast aside, he forgot all about him entirely, which the Torah says explicitly, it was only two years later when it was in his own interests because then he could be the uh, conduit, you know, the one that, that's right. He could be the the one to make the introduction. You know, he could get the finder's fee on behalf of uh, of, of Pharaoh's in, dream interpretation. So uh, again, uh, there's no question. The Torah says clearly the butler was the medium. He was the catalyst, but he was only a, in a self-serving manner. Yes. Only when circumstances, uh, you know, made it convenient for him. And the debt of gratitude that he should have felt to Yosef was completely spurned. He completely neglected that. It says explicitly. What I was going to tell you about the Meshe Chachma, just in response to Nancy's question, the, the Meshe Chachma asks, um, I mean, it doesn't exactly respond to, to the question, doesn't answer the question, but the Mesha Chachma asks, how do Chazal know that Yosef was condemned for two more years? It's true, it says, but how do we know? Maybe that happens to be when Farah had the dream. How do we know that the two extra years were a punishment for Yosef? He says the answer is very simple. What benefit was there to Yosef for being in, in that prison, in that dungeon? The answer is there was a benefit because he was in a political prison. That prison was for political prisoners. That is to say, not for common thieves, for, for smugglers or for, um, you know, other other scoundrels thugs that was a political that was a prison for political prisoners says explicitly the place where pharaoh's prisoners were were incarcerated the meaning of that is that yosef who himself was taken from the land of canaan as we know at the age of 17 and served as a comptroller in a household of a courtier of to the to the the, the palace for a certain period of time but then was plunged into this dungeon in the dungeon he learned about 
he says, Tachsisei Malchus. He learned about politics. He learned about high society. He mixed not with the thugs and the common thieves, but he mixed with the heavy hitters, the high flyers, those who had fallen out of favor with Pharaoh, but when the wheels of fortune turned were restored to power. Uh, the butler was, the baker was not. But the point is that he acquired the, like, uh, understanding of the ways of court by being in the prison with these people. But of course, once the butler and the baker were gone, one of them was restored to the palace. The other one was uh, hung up on the gallows. So why does Yosef need two more years there? The answer is he doesn't need the two more years for his education. He needs it only as a kind of rebuke. It's a form of punishment. And that's how uh, the Meshach Chachma explains. That's how we know. That's why Chazal say that it was a punishment for Yosef to be there for two more years. It wasn't part of the original plan in the sense that he didn't need it any longer, but it was his, his uh, as I say, punishment for, for relying too much on the, on the butler. And uh, okay, we've explained possibly why that might be, but I'm just saying that the ob observation of Rashi stands independently of my shear. The shear tonight just uh, adds a bit of deeper understanding to it. Rabbi, Rabbi, yeah. just, just on a simple basis, I heard because he said Zechartani, which is sort of a, a, a bit okay, but I call it Bochum Adaptak in Chasid of Kachuta Sara because he said Vehiskartani, because he said it twice, and that's the two years, because it, it sort of like overdid the. the, the uh, I see. Yeah. I mean, it would have been enough for him if he had just said Zechartani, that should have been enough for him to yeah. emphasize it, to say, don't forget. That was wrong, and that's why he did forget. Okay, which very good. That, which meant that he he relied. He relied yeah. on him. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said it twice. Right. Right. If he was just doing it as a way of, um, like, normal hishtadlus, that normal. would once would have been enough. Yes. Okay, very good. Very good, because uh, just to clarify for those who didn't hear Rabbi Ziskin's uh, um, suggestion, that Rashi says clearly, the Medrash says, Zachartani v'hiz kartani, the two turns a phrase. So therefore, he had to stay two more years. So the suggestion is, if Yosef had only said Zechartani, that would have been acceptable because that kind of, of uh, uh, simple uh, suggestion would have been would have been acceptable. But by the fact that he said Vihiz Kartani, again, like he emphasized it, it shows that Yosef is really putting too much trust in the butler. Of course, it doesn't mean that for a simple person, such a thing would be rendered as a transgression. But as we know, the principle is that Hashem is exacting with the righteous, even to the nth degree, so that Yosef at his level, someone to say that the, the real Derech HaPshat is that the uh, Yosef should have realized from his own dreams, forget about the dreams of these villains, his own dreams, the dreams that got him into so much trouble with his brothers, but those were prophetic dreams. So he himself should have had, should have relied on his own dreams and Hashem's assurance to him. So rather than get involved with his shtadlos and court, you know, courtiers and politics and influence and that sort of thing, he should at his level should have just had perfect trust in his own divinely inspired destiny and he should not have had that, that need at all. But okay, these are all, I think, uh, uh, valid possibilities. On the contrary, the more facets of the Torah we can expose, the more brilliant is its illumination and uh, kolakavod uh, to everyone for their contributions to our discussion tonight. Rabbi, okay, I think we've, yeah. Brother Raph, can I ask you a quick question? Please. With regards to the circumcised Egyptians, are they or their descendants the multitude who left with us uh, in the uh, in the Yetziat Mitzrayim? The Yetziat Mitzrayim, an interesting possibility. It's an interesting possibility. Um, I mean, I had a, uh, the, the thing is the, the mixed multitude, as you say, are uh, very much of a, um, of a, uh, uh, liability for the Jewish people. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, what became of them? Did they ultimately integrate into Klal Yisrael? Did they drift away? Did they leave when the going gets tough? They, they just went back to Egypt. Difficult to know. The Torah tells us that they left, 
doesn't clarify exactly what, what became of them. But it's an interesting suggestion that you're advancing that maybe their descendants possibly maintained that practice of circumcision. The ironic thing is, though, that apparently Kalal Yisrael neglected circumcision. By the time <laughs> they left Mitzrayim, Hashem yes. had to tell them to be circumcised at, you know, on, on Pesach. But it's an interesting possibility. But uh, uh, may I say that actually in the Egyptian antiquity up to the Roman times, the men uh, uh, that is doing the Brit Milah, the Egyptian. And of course, Moshe Ben, when he writes that, he knew that they were doing that. And he says, this is why they are doing that. It, it's interesting to trace that practice. I mean, today, and for the last, uh, well, more than a thousand years, it has, uh, circumcision has characterized the Arab world, the Muslims, uh, uh, perform circumcision. Actually, here in London, quite a few of those are performed actually by Mohalim, it so happens, but that's that's just by the by. But they have a tradition of, of circumcision. Many of the Africans and uh, many of the Muslims, they do. And it's interesting to speculate as to whether some of that may also be reflected in this ancient example of Yosef sort of encouraging or imposing Brit Mila upon the, upon the, the Egyptian population. Um, so it's interesting to consider to what extent it has become characteristic of those from the Middle East, of Middle Eastern origins. It's interesting, of course, in Europe, um, Generally speaking, uh, people are not circumcised other than, of course, uh, B'nai, B'nai Israel. Um, in the United States of America, I know Nancy is an American. I'm not sure how much uh, uh, well-informed she is about matters of circumcision, but I can tell you from my own locker room survey as a boy not growing up all. in the Midwest. <laughs> not at all. Okay, there you have it. Uh, that circumcision, at least in my day, was very common in the, in the USA, um, you know, not for religious reasons necessarily, but it culturally was very common. I think it is still quite common in the USA. Um, but in Europe, of course, it is not. Of course, the Greeks definitely did not, uh, uh, um, you know, approve of circumcision. That's part of the Hanukkah story, in fact, where the Hellenists, uh, the Jewish Hellenists were, um, uh, you know, uh, seeking to obscure the mark of the circumcision because the Greeks mocked those who were circumcised. I've just been reminded that the royal family here in in England, uh, until the current generation, were circumcised as well. Uh, it seems that the uh, the princes, I don't know whether we still have two or three or one any longer, but in any case, um, it seems that uh, Diana didn't uh, go along with that idea, so therefore her boys were not circumcised, but but otherwise, the men in the royal family, in the in the British royal family, have been circumcised. But okay, again, we're going a bit far afield. Rabbi, uh, the, the, the basis of the Islam having a circumcision is, uh, is Ishmael. Ishmael, Ishmael was uh, 13 years old when Akkurus Borchu told Moshe, to uh, told Avram to have the Avram. Brit Milah. So they do it when they're 13 years old. He, yeah, I don't know if the Muslims still do it at 13. Um, I think some of the Africans do. Uh, and uh, and of course you're right. The Muslims certainly do trace their their uh, roots to Ishmael, and and um, yeah, that's why they they do it. But I think that as a cultural norm, it may have even preceded, uh, well, probably preceded Islam, as you say. The Ishmaelim uh, became Muslim, you know, many many uh, centuries later. The Ishmaelim probably uh, were were. Uh, um, Accustomed to circumcision because of that ancient uh, ancient practice already from the days of, of Avraham Avinu. Yeah, it's, it is interesting to to consider that uh, that phenomenon. But in any case, we do find, according to Chazal, that uh, uh, Yosef imposed circumcision. I just leave you with one last question, um, which I've thought about, and uh, maybe maybe we will take it up in next week's parsha. Actually, Rashi says that when Yosef revealed himself to his brothers that he summoned to them, they were completely uh, uh, speechless. They were dumbfounded. And of course, they were profoundly shamed when Yosef called out, Ani Yosef, Haod Avichai. And he summoned them 
to come close. And Rashi says, Her elahem shuhu mahul. He showed them that he is circumcised in order to indicate that uh, I'm one of you. So the Mephoshim asks, according to what we've said in our shir tonight, Rashi says that Yosef insisted that all the Egyptians would be circumcised, so it doesn't prove anything any longer, because uh, if all the Egyptians are circumcised, so the fact that Yosef is circumcised as well doesn't prove that he's a brother. It was possibly well known that this uh, uh, dictator has imposed all kinds of requirements on the Egyptian people, and this is one of them. So that uh, by itself, the Mephoshim wonder, but maybe we can can take that up next week. Perhaps someone will have an explanation to advance. Uh, if not, perhaps we'll take it up. I can't promise. We'll see. May I mention a parallel? In China, when the Manchu dynasty fell and the, no, the, uh, the uh, Ming dynasty fell and the Manchurian uh, dynasty took over until the establishment of the Republic in the early 20th century, they had the custom initially imposed forcibly by the Manchu rulers that they should have a ponytail and should just galuach uh, rosh. That is, and they kept that. They kept that for several centuries. So it's like the Egyptians who remained with Brit Mila because <laughs> Yosef had imposed that. Yeah, it's interesting. I suppose. Uh... Uh, if it was deeply ingrained in the culture, then it could linger maybe voluntarily or just as a cultural norm for a long time afterwards. Yes. Yeah, okay. We'll have to consider whether uh, ponytail or uh, circumcision, uh, you know, which is the more uh, uh, enduring uh, sign. But again, we'll leave yes. that for the anthropologist to ponder. Okay, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you very and much. Uh, we uh, look forward to uh, more adventures with Rabbi Yonatan Ibshitz, Mir uh, Hashem, in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for your questions, for your 